I, I sometimes describe it as sitting in between a Medium article, an Instagram, and a Strava trace. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. The short introduction you just listened to was Tim Fernando talking about a new application that he's made that uses geolocation to create a logbook of your travels. Hope you enjoy the interview. Hi Tim. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think you're doing something really interesting. And it kind of feels like from the little bit I know about your story that you're combining almost like a social network with uh, some geographical information and maybe even a, a geospatial uh, motor behind the whole thing. But before we jump into all that, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thanks for having me. Um I'm a, I suppose you could call me a computer scientist at heart with a bit of aerospace mixed in. Uh, always been a, a travel and photography geek. And with that came maps. But um, in terms of my career, uh, I, I started off working at Oxford University, uh, actually researching in a geospatial project. That led to me setting up a team which built Oxford University's first mobile services product. Uh, that was about 10 years ago now. And so that was soon after the, around the time the iPhone and the T-Mobile G1 came out. So very early days in, in that, that part of the tech landscape. And um, since then, I worked on a bunch of different startups and companies that have helped grow their products and develop their products. And eventually that led to me creating Explorio and, and starting off with my co-founders. Uh, so that's a very brief intro to uh, what I used to do. No, that, that's perfect. It's really nice to have a, to, to give the listeners a bit of an understanding of who we're talking to. Now, you mentioned Explorio. This is the reason why I, uh, I've been so excited to talk to you today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Explorio? Yeah, uh, Explorio started off by tackling a personal need. It was really an itch I had uh, in that I was creating a lot of geodata and I had no real way of being able to view it. And uh, so I was using all the classic apps, so there's Foursquare and Facebook and uh, all the rest of it. But actually, I was not able to find my own data very easily because all, all these products are really based around feeds Um so initially knocked up a prototype which pulled together my social data so i could look at it uh, on a map and look at it irrespective of time and sort of thinking through that problem i uh, quickly realized actually that you know that yes it's great to look at all of your stuff in one place but actually what your, your trips and your travels are quite often some of the best experiences of your life I wanted a way to be able to represent those and not just uh, the little moments, but also the journey and the story of uh, that particular trip. And that is really how the feature set behind Explorio came about. And once it went out to a few other people, it's like, oh, OK, there are a lot of other people who actually want this and uh, find it really interesting. So that that's how we uh, started. And um, it, it's really grown from there. Um, just a little background here for, for the listeners. So you have a couple of different apps, like on, on different platforms, of course. You also have a website. And what it looks like from the outside anyway, it, it looks like a, a geographic diary. So it records my trips and sort of pulls in lots of different information from different sources uh, around the web. And it's a very sort of user-focused, journey-orientated. It, it almost feels like a, a, a social network for, for map geeks. Yeah, I guess, I guess you could call it that. It's um, it, it's something, I, I sometimes describe it as sitting in between a Medium article, an Instagram, and a Strava trace, because it, it sort of combines all three of those, and it sort of tries to take the best aspects of those three platforms to create a long-form uh, way of representing a trip. So it's capturing a lot of detail it captures the story. It captures all those little things that 
you experienced, but you may not have had the mindset to actually manually record either by writing or taking a photograph, like the, the station that you changed at or the the particular road that you drove through the Swiss Alps or, uh, you, you know, little details like that, which are actually really part of the whole travel experience. And um, so, yes, we, we have several features. The, the biggest feature is what we call trips, which is essentially uh, – a start date and an end date and everything that happened in between that. And that's the, the GPS trace, the, uh, the venues that were visited, whether it's a museum or a station or a hotel or, or whatever it is, we detect the points of interest automatically. Um, we pull in the photographs that you took as well as any annotations that you write along the way. And those get added in and, put into this quite I think quite a unique format which really gives the viewer a lot of uh, depth and understanding into what happened and really helps the creator to tell that story we also have a map view which is every piece of data that you've recorded on a map and you can then filter that by type points of interest whether it's a restaurant or you could search through that and we also have uh, some other fun views, uh, like one called Travel Graphs, which also has an augmented reality view. So that's like a very high level view of uh, the earth and everywhere you've traveled and, and the journey is not just like a scratch map, but the actual paths that you took across the planet. And that's shown year by year. So we've got a bunch of different features, which are really, again, like, like you said, Daniel, centered around the map. And they, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like a lot of fun uh, as well. And I love the idea of having something that's just sort of passively recording in my pocket as I move around the world. But it, that, that brings a few issues by itself, I could imagine. So traditionally, recording a GPS location and processing that has been really expensive in terms of battery life. And, and, and another issue I can immediately see with this would be the whole question around privacy and uh, yeah, data security. But maybe you could touch on exactly how this is recording. Like it's running a GPS in the background, I would imagine. Are you doing any other sort of wizardry there? Yeah, th those are two really good points, though, Daniel. It's um, with the tracking, we built everything from scratch. So we really looked at the problem we were trying to solve from a very high level. That problem was we wanted people to be able to leave this on without really thinking about it. Just use as little battery as possible so that people aren't affected by using it. So we, we started from that point and saying, okay, we want all day battery life, but we also want uh, significantly more data or detail than just the significant locations. Like uh, you, you can do very coarse GPS tracking or not even GPS tracking, but Wi-Fi tracking, you can do that very coarsely, very inexpensively. And so we wanted to have more data than that, but maintain our battery life. So we looked at the problems very carefully, and it was a quite a, a, a long and um, uh, interesting journey. We, we actually got some funding from the European Space Agency because they got quite excited about the, the tech we were building. We analyzed uh, stop detection we, we tried to figure out okay how do we turn off the gps as much as possible but how do we turn it back on intelligently how do we increase and reduce the granularity according to the type of travel how do we reduce um, not just the power drain on from the gps chip but also the the system chips there's actually a lot of power that's used not just by the, the receiver, the GPS receiver, but the, the processor and also the, the SSD that's connected to it uh, for writing that data. So we, we really tried to look at all of the problems, all of the drain points, and then we built our tech to uh, avoid hitting those problems. It's quite, uh, quite gratifying because we, we started off uh, you know, with our early prototypes where people say, oh, this is using too much power. And I think it's been about two years now and we haven't had a single complaint about power. Uh, we, we've sort of got it to that stage where you can just forget about it. You can just leave it on. You don't need to think about it. And it, I think 
the vast majority of our users see less than 2% train per day. I think that's a really important aspect of what you're doing here is this this idea that a journey, like we were saying before, that the, the whole event, you know, from the time you leave, the time you come back can be recorded in, in such a passive way. So we don't need to constantly take out our phone, although I can imagine people would be anyway taking pictures, but all those little things, you know, the the exact route you took through Rome, for example, that would be recorded without sort of any um, conscious thought, if you know what I mean. I really like that. And I love the idea of displaying it on a map, of course. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it, it's kind of interesting because even with me personally, I've always been an avid photographer and I used to uh, quite often take thousands of pictures. And as I've got older and uh, more time poor, I've, become less inclined to take photographs everywhere. And Esplorio kind of fills this this uh, in-between place because I, I'm passively recording stuff as I travel. And I'm all, I always feel reassured that, I'm, that it's being recorded for me and that I'm not going to forget this place because I can just quickly look back on it and see the place that I visited without me having to do anything. And it, it's, it's quite comforting, actually, because I think there's this huge fear... Uh, certainly for me, when I used to travel, when I was like, oh, I got to remember this place because this is amazing. Or this, you know, this route I'm taking uh, through uh, driving from Venice to Salzburg, there's this amazing small road off the motorway, uh, which is one of the most scenic roads I've ever taken. And I, I want to re- remember that. But, uh, and I used to have to either write it down, which meant that I'd lose the you know, the, the diary at, at some point, um, or it would be on paper somewhere or, or something like that. But now I just sort of, I just enjoy the moment rather than worry about that. Before I asked, uh, it was a bit bit tricky of me really, I asked a two-part question. And the first part it was about about the GPS and how you're kind of solving that problem in terms of battery life, but still getting the, the, the level of detail which, which people might be interested in if they want to trace that exact route through through Rome, for example. But I, I also asked a question about um, tracking and data collection and issues around privacy. Uh, I think that, uh, that this tracking and uh, it leads to a lot of personalization, exactly like it does in your system here, but it, but it also gives a lot of conflicts along the way. How are you solving that problem? Or how are you protecting people's uh, data? Yeah, so everything that our users record on Esporio is stored privately by default. This is something we, we care quite a lot about. I think creating a product like this, you become acutely aware of how this data can be used by people who may not have aligned views with you. And so we, we took this stance, which was to make all of the data private by default. We don't sell the data to anybody. Uh, we're not trying to allow other companies to come in and try and sell you products. So it, it's it's an interest. It's a really interesting problem, and I think as we've seen in recent years, uh, a lot of personal data can be used in ways that people never even thought possible. And we're kind of entering this new era where people are really caring about privacy, and really that I think the industry is changing for the better. And uh, so we, we've tackled it very simply. We just keep stuff private. That's how we see it going from now. But uh, there are lots of, I think I've got lots of views on how the industry should be and how we should be tackling these things as a whole, because I don't see the current situation as being particularly sustainable. Privacy by default, I'm all about that. That sounds like a great idea. But it's also an interesting contrast, I think, because on one side you have privacy by default, which, again, I'm all for. But also um, the social aspect of these kind of things is becoming more and more important, and we really want to share things. And I could imagine something like travel, our adventures. You know, These are things that are really important to us, as well as being personal. And we might want to sort of push them out to the world and share our location with people, tell the story of where we've been. How, how do you balance those two issues? So I, I think when you're sharing your journey, you you know who you want to share to, right? You, you've got an audience in mind. You, you either want to say, hey, this is an awesome trip um, and share it with the world, which is cool. Like, you know, that, that's no big deal. Um, or you want to share it with your friends and family, which we also, we do, you know, we do this private sharing model 
uh, as well as public sharing. But I think the danger is not is less about those two and more about a company coming in and using that data to figure out your preferences and then inject advertising into another feed that you're viewing and therefore change your views. And and we we've seen a lot of evidence of that in the political scene especially, and how that probably has changed the outcomes of lots of voters. So I, I think they're, sl- they're, they're nuanced problems and we, we have to look at them individually. But I think if you're choosing to go out there and say, okay, I'm putting this out in the public, that's great. But if you're saying um, I'm posting something on my favorite social network and that data is then directly being sold to a, a, a think tank or to another company, which then can sell it to another company who can then target you in a very specific way without you even realizing that your data was what caused that, then I think that's a different different issue. So I think we, we're trying to avoid that second problem. And I don't think the, the first and, you know, sharing with an audience that you choose is quite the same thing. And I completely agree. It's just really interesting to get to, to hear someone else's opinions on this. Like you've obviously thought about it. It's, it's part of your application. So you've got some policies around it, I could imagine, and spend some time thinking about it. That, that's why it's interesting to sort of gather your views. If we could just stay with this topic just for one more question, I'd really appreciate it. Um, because often the, the, um, the argument against sort of privacy by default w- would be something like if you've got nothing to hide, then, then why are you scared? And I've also in recent times heard people use the argument that in terms of creators, we talked a little bit about creators on your platform before. So people that are making these journeys and probably um, adding more notes and photos and things like that and sort of pushing them out to the world, just like we'd see on other platforms. I've heard the argument that for creators, the danger isn't piracy, the danger is obscurity. Well, what, what would you think about those kind of arguments? Uh, if I'm understanding the question right, the the question is whether um, by not making things open by default, the content creators are having are going to be obscured. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, I, I think when people when people use that argument, their their idea is that the you know the internet is a noisy place. There's lots of people vying for our attention, so the danger isn't that someone's taking your data anymore or taking your content and posting at different places. The danger is almost that you don't get that exposure, that you're just buried in, you know, this feed, like we talked about before in social networks, that, that you don't get the exposure that you might need as a creator. I think if you're a creator, you're actively trying to publish and promote your content. And I think that's a little different to the problem of, people using your data unexpectedly. So I'd I'd almost say it's better for a creator to be private by default because the creator would be trying to publish their stuff publicly. And if if by default things are private, then your signal-to-noise ratio is actually going to be better because only the people who are actively trying to push stuff out are pushing stuff out to as many people. So I I, I don't – I'd I'd probably have to think about that a little bit harder but that sounds i'm not totally convinced by the argument there and when it comes to the argument of if you've got nothing to hide then why not share everything well the the problem is people can interpret what you share in a thousand different ways and we see this every day on twitter when somebody says something slightly badly phrased and all of a sudden it's on the front page of the news the next day it's very difficult to get the correct message across. So I, I think that's a very poor argument that's saying, well, if you've got nothing to hide, because people can go off and take that little snippet of data that you've shared and interpret it in a thousand ways that you never imagined it could be shared, um, it could be interpreted in. So those are my sort of thoughts on that, I think. I really appreciate that. And again, I realize that perhaps we've got a little bit off topic there. But in terms of geospatial data and tracking, I I think this is a really, this is a big issue and and it deserves a little bit of time. It deserves a little bit of uh, uh, airtime and and people should be thinking these thoughts, I think, and sort of weighing arguments from from both sides. So so thanks very much for that. Now, back to Explorio. Is this going to be the end of paper maps? Like Because you're so much, your ability to capture a journey is 
magnified, you know, so many times by doing this with, with your application. You, you know, you're just in your pocket and it's passively working away. It's absorbing feeds from other places. And you, are, are we going to see people drawing on paper maps in the future to, to capture their journey? Or is this the, the death of the paper map? Oh, I don't know. Paper maps, I, I think if we look at the sale of paper maps, they've probably been dropping for quite a long time. Certainly, I remember the last time I used paper maps in anger, where I used it as sort of my main thing. It was probably one of my first big road trips in 2004. And that those were the days when I, th I think I was using Microsoft Autoroute on a laptop with a GPS device uh, connected by serial port with a crazy number of wires in a car. And, but still the paper map was still the Bible because that was going to be accurate. And Microsoft only had like 30% coverage of Italy and France at that time. But I, I think the problem with the paper map is it, its utility is these days very much limited to enthusiasts and uh, people who really, really love the look of them. Um, so I, I really hope they don't die because there's something really wonderful about them. There's the, you know, the, the tactile nature and I think the ability to explore on a map is quite different. And that's partly because of the scale of them, because a, a good map that's well drawn, you can, you can put it on the floor or on a big table and you can kind of run your fingers over it and sort of find things that you you wouldn't have really thought about looking at on a digital map because digital maps scale dynamically and so you'll spot these little rivers or little train lines which you would never think to look at on a digital map so i i, I really think that there is still very much a place for paper maps that that is utilitarian but I think the market for them, sadly, is, is probably shrinking. On the other hand, I, I have a bunch of maps on my wall um, just, from, just for aesthetic reasons, because I think they're beautiful. They're, there's something really quite special about having a, a map to look at and to kind of see the patterns in a, in a city or the, the, the relief in mountains or whatever it is. So I think... It's it's a tough business, I'd imagine, to be in paper maps right now. But I hope they don't die. That's a, that's a relatively big call to make to say that they're just going to disappear. They've been here for a while. I'm sure they'll hang in there for a bit more. But like you were saying as well, um, we're we're expecting more from maps and digital maps, especially. They're not they're, they're almost becoming worlds. I, I would argue for that. They're beca if you think about Google Earth, like it scales infinitely. It spans the entire world yeah it needs to be updated and maybe it's not you know quite one-to-one -one because you're limited to your screen size but we're getting close we're getting there and it's more of a world now than like a a map in the traditional understanding of what maps are yeah i i think a thing for me still i mean i i i'm looking at a large monitor right now but that is still a fraction of the size of full-size map I think until the day when we have maybe augmented reality maps, which have a really good user interface, I think that size is something that can't quite be replicated on a digital map just yet. Because you, you can imagine, for example, let's say you've got a map of, I don't know, a map of uh, Switzerland, and it's A0 size, or maybe even bigger than A0, some, something like that. And at that A0 size, you will be able to identify every train line, every canal, every river. You'd be able to see the relief. You'd be able to see forests. You'd be able to see almost every single detail you'd be able to see at the most detailed level on a digital map. But if you look at a digital map on your screen of Switzerland right now, you won't be able to see any of those details while looking at the whole country. and that, I think, is still a user experience problem that is yet to be solved. I, I think it probably will be solved eventually, but there is something a little bit special when it comes to exploring and when it comes to discovering things that these paper maps still provide that I don't think has yet been captured. And, and obviously, you know, content like ours, 
can help people discover stuff. But if you're an individual who's trying to just look at places and just find places, and, and this is something I, I, I quite often do, is I, I will go to a new place and I will just spend an hour or two studying the map and trying to find vantage points for good photographs or really interesting things in the area that haven't been found by other people. That is something I think we're yet to get to on the digital stage or yet to make it easy on the digital stage. That's a really interesting idea, that like finding things that haven't been found by other people. Now, when I think about Explorio and I think about the platform that you're building, inevitably, like if, if you treat it like a social media, for example, if you share things and, and go in and see where other people, you're going to find where they're going to be. But in this, and you're going to experience and get tips and feedbacks and there's going to be reviews and that kind of thing. And you'll get a sense of what it might be like if you go there. But in the same token, you also see where people haven't been you know, the route less traveled. I can imagine, for example, that you collect a lot of data. And I can imagine that when you look at, uh, when you run some analysis on this data, maybe look on it on a map, you could see patterns starting to form. So I guess, yeah, you, you'll see popular routes maybe, but you also see the, the places less traveled. And maybe you'll be able to start sort of pushing people over that way and relieve the impact of, of tourism, for example. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting. We, we were working with uh, London and Partners, which is sort of uh, London's tourism agency and business development uh, agency. And uh, they have a campaign which is to get tourists to the less lesser known parts of London. Like you said, this is actually a really big problem. And you know, Barcelona is, is particularly well known for being tourist crazy. What we have is a lot of data on, okay, people go here and here and here, and then they like to go down to this part of London because, well, we we find out. And it can help to really show places which have been undiscovered or not very well known. And I think for the millennial traveler who is now very much coming of age and starting to have money to spend on travel there's a huge sense of fomo of fear of missing out the mindset of people in their late 20s early 30s is sort of uh, i want to do something unique i want to do something that's special i want to do something you know very crudely that's it is instagrammable but it's something that my friends haven't been to so there is this change in the travel market um less to the top 10 things to do in New York and more, okay, what is that great coffee experience I can have in Brooklyn? Or what is this little niche museum uh, in the Upper West Side that nobody has ever heard of, but is really cool and unique? And you're starting to see that with the experiences market as well. You'll see Airbnb is really pushing these unique experiences and it, the whole market is sort of switching from uh, selling a flight in a hotel to selling an experience. And you, you, you look at, for example, EasyJet's advertising is a good example where they don't sell anything about the flight in their adverts. They don't show you seats. They don't show you the service. They don't show you any of that. They just concentrate on what's going to happen once you get to your destination and all the great things that you're going to do there. And uh, th that's sort of the mindset of people now. And it's it's something we're quite excited to be part of and be able to help people share uh, the more unique parts of the world that other people have not seen. Yeah, I come from New Zealand. And when I think about the way people travel around New Zealand, there's some very clear geographic limits you know there's a mountain range right down the middle of the south island for example and there's only two or three ways over that so of course people get funneled down certain tracks and you know there's certain spots that are, are, are simply breathtaking so there's a reason people want to be there uh, so i can imagine these kind of things would really stand out when you look at your data but has there been anything that's surprised you when you look at this data have there been any sort of global trends or local trends where you've seen oh well i didn't expect that yeah, I, I think there's. I think one of the biggest things I've noticed is how many routes exist which are totally unmapped or unknown. And you, you go to some parts of the world and you find that there's a ferry route that you, you won't 
find anywhere. You, you sort of Google for it um, and you try and find it and nobody's written about it. Nobody, uh, it's not advertised on any website because it's run by some local company that doesn't really have much of an internet presence. And uh, you start to realize that so much of the world is, it, it feels like the whole world has been discovered. But in reality, there's, there's so much stuff out there that has barely been touched. And, and some of that's very close to home. I, mean, I, I live just outside of London and I've traveled to most of Europe. Um, and yet uh, I, I find that there's this volcano off the coast of Sicily, which has only in the past so two, three years started having uh, tours around it, walking tours, and this volcano is active and it's erupting. Um, and th this is something that you can go do. You can take a boat to, over to the island and and take a walk over an a erupting volcano. And it, it's, it's sort of fascinating because you, you won't find that on any of the big sites. You won't find it in any of the big um, travel guides. You will find it... Um, if you happen to know and you, if you happen to find uh, some very niche advertising. Yeah, there's, there's so much so it's fascinating stuff we, we see in the data. And, and another good example is off the coast of Sri Lanka, they found blue whales, uh, that blue whales travel through that area. And they only found this out about 10 years ago. On our sort of, uh, we, we, we have an anonymized map of where everybody has traveled. And uh, on that map, you can actually see the routes of all the boats that are going off to see the blue whales. And you can actually take a, a sum of all of those routes and you can see very specifically where the blue whales are being sighted because you can see these straight lines where the boat is trying to get somewhere and then it starts to trawl around. And then all of a sudden it it's goes very, very slowly in one particular area because clearly they're tracking the whales. And so we, we see things like that. We see out in Siberia, you, you see the Trans-Siberian Express. You'll see that very few people get off at certain towns. Um, or even if we look at North Korea, uh, we'll see some of the places that people go to. And I think you can start to see that there's a, a bit of a um, pattern in North Korea, probably because the people are being funneled uh, very specifically by the government to, to go to these places. It's really fascinating looking at all this data. And what, one of the interesting ones I'm, I'm really uh, watching out for at the moment is the there's a new bridge that's been opened between Hong Kong and Macau. For so long, all you've, you've, you've had so many boats going between Hong Kong and Macau. And now I think we're going to see this sudden shift onto the bridge because that's going to be the quickest way across. So, um, yeah, we see some really, really uh, interesting uh, stuff when looking at our data. It's a lot of fun. I, I can imagine. I've, um, I've talked to somebody recently who um, they were a part of an organization called Flight Radar 24, and they have this huge network where they capture flight data from around the world and visualize it on a map. It's a, it's a really interesting network and platform that they've built over there. And what they say is they can, by tracking these planes, they can also see the position of the jet stream. So, and they can see it change over time because they obviously track these planes in real time and they can see the effect of um, border conflicts and uh, political sort of conflicts around the world and they can see it change over time. So yeah, I, I can understand, I could appreciate that you would be seeing some of these similar sort of things just by, just by knowing people's travel locations, where they go and how, how they get there. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, uh, flights are particularly interesting because, of course, we um, will often get GPS reception on flights. And uh, so if you look at any major airport, you can actually see, OK, these are the uh, the flight paths that the planes are taking in and out of the airport. And you can see the noise abatement procedures for uh, the aircraft, I mean, very similar to flight radar. Exactly. You can also see things like how long people are having to cross borders, you know, which borders are efficient and which ones aren't when you're trying to tr cross by land. And there's so many little, little things that you can spot in this data, which is really extraordinary.
I, we were hoping we can expose more of that in meaningful forms for people to actually use in the future. So be able to understand that, okay, if I'm planning a route this way, these are the things you can expect. Hey, um, we are slowly but surely coming to the end of our time together. But, but before I let you go, I've just got a couple more questions questions for you. And one of them would be, when you think about mapping and geospatial and maybe in terms of what you're building, your application, your, your platform, what are you most excited about when you think about the future of this? Oh, when I think about the future, I think a, a lot of it is comes down to customization. There's a lot of stuff that I'm quite excited about in terms of presentation and in terms of um, being able to see your data and being able to answer questions from your data instinctively. But the customization for your future travels is really, really interesting. And I think we t talked a little bit about the privacy and how do we balance this idea of custom uh, personalization and privacy. And I think something that we're in quite a unique position to do is to really understand some of your preferences and then give you tools to help you plan stuff. And like, if I give you a very specific example, Meta Search has you know gradually got better and better for flights and you know people like Kayak and Priceline and Expedia. They, you know the engines have got better and better, but fundamentally they're still using the same model which was developed in the early noughties or maybe even late nineties. It's 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 still very much all about a from and to box and a from date and a to date box. And something we're really excited about is is trying to fill that stuff in for you without you really having to think about it. Because people, like I was saying earlier, people are more interested in experiences and, and sometimes they don't know where they want to go. Yeah, with, with new aircraft like the 787 and the A350, there's so many new routes opening up and so many more destinations you can get to very easily that you couldn't before. And so the choice is bewildering. You can travel to so many places on this planet for actually very little money but it's very very difficult to choose because you don't really have an idea of w what to choose from because there's too much choice and when people have too much choice they get paralyzed it's very difficult to make that decision and so we we have this sort of opportunity to have understood where you know where, where you've been and the types of things you like to do and not advertise but help to filter the the, your search workflow so instead of saying okay i want to fly from london heathrow and i want to go to tokyo narita i'm going to say actually i want to go somewhere i haven't been before and it does it shouldn't be hard for me to travel i want to be able to do it in four days whatever and you'd be getting a list of options based on that rather than having to manually go through and test okay, how much are the flight prices? How much are the hotels? How much of this? How much of that? And sort of do, you know, go through the rigmarole of visiting. I, th I think the industry average is something like each person visits 19 sites before uh, booking a, a trip. And the decision cycle is usually four to six weeks from first thinking they want to travel somewhere to actually booking that travel. And a large part of that is actually just figuring out where to go. So we've got this opportunity to sort of say, well, you've, you've been to these places, um, you like uh, this sort of stuff, great, or you haven't tried any of this stuff. You know, you've, you've never been uh, to a desert and you've never been sandboarding or you've never done this, or you've never done that. So maybe that's interesting for you. Maybe you'd like to do that and sort of help you to think about your future travel more and experiences rather than having to almost have this huge amount of information in your head and process it by yourself in a very arduous fashion. So those are the, the, the problems that I'm really excited about solving in the future, because I think that's really going to be really exciting for a lot of people and really help people to travel more and to travel better. Now, to, to solve some of these problems, to answer the kind of questions that you're talking about, I'm assuming it needs to be you know, your analysis needs to be based on an enormous amount of data. Can you give us some idea of how much data you collect? Yeah, so we, um, so I think in terms of what we call unique places on the planet, so that's sort of 
areas which could be considered a shop or a museum or you know a point of interest where I think our users have visited about 120 million places and there's uh, something around 40 million photographs and um, so the the amount of data that each user records is quite is quite a lot and I, I think it, it's not just it, it's not just about the quantity but it's also about the quality and the usefulness of the data. And if I give you an example, um, if you live in a particular place, let's say where I live, I live about 20 minutes drive from Heathrow, uh, about 40, uh, London Heathrow Airport, that is about 40 minutes drive from London Luton Airport, about an hour and 20 minutes from London Stansted, about an hour and 10 from London Gatwick, and maybe about one hour 45 from London City Airport. Um, your your typical search will say, okay, London, right? And you'll go, uh, I, I want to travel from London airports to somewhere. But actually, I've got Birmingham Airport, which is about one hour for me. I've also got Bristol. I've got Southampton. I've got Bournemouth, there's, uh, and, and there's a bunch of other places you can travel from. And sometimes the routing and the, uh, the pricing is actually much better to travel from one of these other airports rather than uh, one of the London airports. And this is something that is actually very trivial to do if you know where the person lives or even the town where they live. You can start to look at all the airports which are accessible by public transport or by driving, and you can start to give results just based on that. And that is one data point that is incredibly powerful to be able to make that idea that actually we should be searching for flights, not just from London, but from Southampton, from Birmingham, from Bristol, and combining those into, into more meaningful search results. So that that's like a very specific example on how one small piece of data um, is very, very powerful in the travel context. So we're not really, you know, it's great. People are recording lots of data and that gives us potential insights. But I feel like in travel, there's actually a lot of easy wins that people are not yet uh, looking at. And those are the things that I think are the, the first sort of problems that we're going to end up solving. Tim, I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. And but before you disappear there, can you just tell us where we can go to learn more about Explorio? Uh, yeah, Explorio.com is our homepage. You can also search for us on the Apple App Store at uh, just Explorio, E-S-P-L-O-R-I-O. -O. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Really enjoyed talking to you, Daniel. Take care. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel, and I just want to say thanks so much for tuning in again this week. I really appreciate it. I'd also like to remind you that you are more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. It's at Mapscaping on Facebook and Twitter, and map underscore view on Instagram. I'd love to hear from you. See you next week. Bye.